Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and in each episode, we dive into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice, empowering you with knowledge and power to overcome any obstacles or any chronic illness. Today, I am absolutely delighted to introduce my friend, Jen Fugo. She is a clinical nutritionist who supports adults who failed conventional medicine to beat chronic skin conditions such as eczema, psoriasis, rosacea, dandruff, hives, and many things else, other things we're going to talk about today in her virtual practice. She founded her own line of skincare and supplements available at www.quellshop, that's Q u e l l shop h s o p dot com and is the most the host the most the host with the most the host with the most <laughs> of the healthy skin show podcast with over one point one million downloads. We we're just talking about podcasting and all the tips and tricks in the background that we do. Jen Hose holds her master's degree in human nutrition from the University of Bridgeport and is a licensed dietitian, nutritionist, and certified nutrition specialist. Thank you for letting me get through that intro, Jen, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited and honored to be here. Yes. I mean, we've just been friends and followed each other's kind of pathways in the background for a lot long while. Um, I always love to start with background story. Like, how did you get into this area? Do you have any personal stories or uh, reasons that you got into skin? Unfortunately, yes, I do. Um, my The reason that I ended up specializing, I guess, in these chronic skin conditions is because when I was in the midst of my uh, master's program, I developed something called dysidroidic eczema on my hands. And what that is, is a, a very specific type of eczema for those who might not realize that impacts the palms and sometimes also the bottom of the feet. But I just had it on the palms of my hands. And you get these like weird kind of clear br uh, little blisters and the skin really dries out. It flares up, the, bl the blisters eventually break and it's like oozy and awful and painful and so itchy. Yes. And then it dries up and the cycle starts again. And this began in the midst of, I was already gluten-free, dairy-free, egg-free for six years at that point. I had a really like and I still do, toxic, non-toxic, um, organic lifestyle. I was doing all the right things, except I had taken on this uh, huge endeavor of going back for a master's program full-time while working full-time. And I have never had so much suffering in my life. I'm not comparing it to other people because I know, um, Dr. Jill, you've gone through a lot of health situations yourself, but you don't realize um, a lot of times how much you use a part of your body until it, you, you can't, you know, like you can't wash your hair, you can't wash your hands because water burns so badly. You can't go to the gym because the weights actually tear your skin. And so my skin became thinner and thinner as I went through these cycles. The dermatologist was like, well, just put some steroid cream on and then cover it with Vaseline. And I was like, oh, Okay, um, how do I? I mean, it's my hands. How, right. how do right. I get through my day? I have cats, I have things I need to do. Um, so it became very challenging for me to function. Um, I'd wake up in the middle of the night with blood on the sheets because I found that I was scratching myself in the middle of the night while asleep. It just was really, really awful. And it wasn't until my husband was like, maybe you should start thinking about this from a different perspective. What if you were your client? What are some of the things that you might actually look at? And it took time. And honestly, people are always like, what'd you do to make it go away? And, and I wouldn't even want you to do that because I know so much more now. Um, what I, I'm not even sure why what I did worked, but that created a lot of empathy for me to realize that yes, we have various conditions like thyroid conditions where we suffer a lot of times in silence and in private, people can't necessarily see that you have this condition that impacts so many different body functions. But when it is literally on your skin, especially areas that are forward facing, like the palms of your hands, where somebody can like kind of dive out of shaking your hand because they see that you look almost like you're infected with something or it's on your face or somewhere visible. 
it does a tremendous amount of damage to your sense of confidence. And again, everyone thinks either you don't know how to clean yourself, you're not using the right soap, uh, you have some sort of infection that you're neglecting. They don't understand the level of pain and suffering that you go through trying to manage this highly uncontrollable skin situation because you really don't know what type of skin you're going to wake up to at, on any given day. And so that was what ultimately sparked my curiosity. And as I dove deeper into it, I realized the way that we approach skin from a more integrative perspective was kind of limited because everyone sort of lumped it in with autoimmune disease. And that was where, I don't know, all the research, all the interviews. I mean, I have like over 350 episodes of the Healthy Skin Show. You're on the Healthy Skin Show too, talking about various um, things that we don't necessarily think could be connected to chronic skin issues that really complicate it, I think, and separate it from other conditions like, say, celiac disease or Hashimoto's and um, other autoimmune conditions. And so we talk all about eczema, psoriasis, rosacea. I mean, even like I also had hydrogenitis suppurativa, also known as HS. And so a lot of these conditions, people suffer in silence. There's a lot of shame. And so I've made it my mission to help people figure out what some of these root causes are so that they can begin using if they would like to, a combination of conventional and integrative options to hopefully speed the process along, because I don't think we're here to just like suffer through life. I think that we are here to live life, right? Being there as a mom, a parent, um, a caregiver, a daughter, a son, a friend, a, a coworker. Like we have all these other roles in life that are so important. And so I just want to empower people to be able to bring things to their derms, to ask better questions, to get better results, and to utilize the best tools that work for them to ultimately help the skin symptoms hopefully calm down and even potentially resolve entirely. Jen, I love that. And I really, I'm sorry you had to suffer, but clearly it's given you a passion for this topic. And it's interesting. One of the reasons I am so happy to have you in the show and personally um, so proud of the work you're doing is because I was like you, I had the severe dyshidrotic eczema as a child. I would scratch and bleed on my, like when you talk about your yeah. story, that could have been me. I totally understand. And the hands, like you said, you can't do anything. I remember wearing like cotton gloves to bed with the Vaseline and the steroid, right? Cause that's yep. the only way you couldn't scratch yourself to death. And then like you do in the middle of the night, you pull them off. Cause you wouldn't know you, the itch is so bad. Sometimes that you'd still, I just remember that. So well. I can relate to every point. And then after the mold and the issues there, I had horrible horrible, horrible periorbital dermatitis that looked like I was like mm -hmm. so diseased. And like you said, I always felt like, I mean, that's a billboard and here I am supposed to be a doctor. The eczema was before I was a physician. Some of the eye stuff was after. And I'm like, how in the world could people trust me if I look like I can't take care of myself because they don't yeah. know the whole story. So thank you for being a leader in this field. Um, where do we start with this? As we know, there's like membranes and permeability and gut, but what give us kind of an overview of because uh, their skin stuff often is connected to similar things. Maybe we look skin and overview and then we go deeper into specific. Yeah. I would say that I think what complicates skin is that there's usually a combination of root causes going on. It's not usually just one thing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you go to the derm, you, they give you meds, you may or may not want to go that route. And I respect that. Everybody's choice is their own. And usually the first thing is like getting rid of any kind of like toxic uh, chemicals, um, your cleaning products, your laundry detergent, your body care products. You try and swap those all out. And a lot of times people won't find that to be sufficient. So then they're possibly rehoming their pets, yeah. tearing out carpeting from their home. They're trying to do everything in the external environment to address this because that's what they think will ultimately get things to stop. And then maybe we go down the route of um, food allergies. And, and, you know, if it is a food allergy, usually it's fairly strong fairly straightforward for like an allergist to figure out what that may be, especially, and when I say food allergy, I mean like an, an actual IgE food right. allergy. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's this whole host of other issues. And so when I started my practice, I think this is helpful for people to know like 
why I care so much, especially about liver detoxification. And, and I don't mean like liver detox or liver cleanse in the trendy sense. It's really a beautiful transformative process that our liver does to help support us on so many levels. But when I graduated from my master's program, I used to do a lot of organic acid testing. And one, I was working with gut clients. So people who had diarrhea, constipation, belching, bloating, all that stuff. And one thing that I noticed was oftentimes that benzoic acid or benzoates were elevated. And we could attribute that to dietary benzoates, but the reality was most of my clients weren't eating processed foods where you would find those. And then sometimes equally hippuric acid or hippurate was also elevated. And so I started to dive into this heart because I found it to be a really odd pattern that te that tended to get overlooked in the whole process. And so I started to realize that with gut clients and cases that there was this significant problem happening with phase two liver detox. And so as I started to get more and more uh, chronic skin issue clients, as I shared my story and we started the podcast and whatnot, I began to see that it was of even greater importance to those individuals because the liver detoxification capacity in phase two is highly nutrient driven. It's not like you can cast or oil pack your way out of it. You can't even really take sufficient, I find herbs to really increase the level of nutrients required to run phase two pathways sufficiently if they're highly depleted already, which a lot of times they are because people have had these issues for a really, really long time. And they have other confounding factors, like they have chronic um, gut microbiome imbalances that also chip away and overwhelm that system because the benzoates are produced, they can be produced within the GI tract and then have to go to the liver in order to be processed. And so as the supplies get lower and lower for this system to run, your body is like becoming increasingly reactive. So people will find that they'll begin to react to salicylates mm -hmm. or salicylates, depending on how you pronounce them, which is a type of um, chemical in found in pl various plants and such. And it's something that shouldn't be a problem, but as especially, for example, as glycine specifically, the amino acid glycine becomes depleted, we become increasingly sensitive to salicylates. And so this is something that you'll see in eczema, for example, with psoriasis, you'll start to see a really significant increase in fatty deposits within the liver that things kind of get gummed up. They don't run as well. That's why it's unfortunately a comorbidity within uh, psoriasis that we start to see increases in liver fibrosis and, um, and other liver issues, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, yeah. which I know is being turned into metabolic associated yeah, fatty Malta, liver disease. I believe a name that we have to learn. A Same thing. Name. Right. <laughs> exactly. And so what really hasn't been focused on in a lot of these conditions is that beautiful interplay between what's going on in the gut what's happening to the liver as a result and the need for nutrients that may or may not be coming in at a sufficient level to at least help the body have a better fighting chance at dealing with the problem. Because if you just dive into a lot of these like gut protocols, right? Yeah. Say you, you do yeah. a stool test, you find out you have you know, a bunch of bacteria and unfriendly mm -hmm. fungus and all this stuff hanging out in different spots throughout the GI tract. As you start to deal with it, it's not uncommon for individuals who have skin issues to start to see a flare up. And it's yes. because their liver can't bear the brunt of what's happening. I think that's part of it. The other part is sometimes we're just trying to push things too fast for what our body's capacity to heal is at that particular time. And so I think there's this beautiful dance in honoring these really, truly important pathways um, that help us ultimately manage um, how reactive the skin becomes. Um, we also find, and I don't know if you've seen this with um, more like, I call it histamine overload type cases, so chronic hives or urticaria, dermatographia, that also when you really nutritionally support the liver 
and that's before you start in like trying to deal with yeah. the gut and whatnot, um, that also can reduce reactivity. And in some instances, it's helped some of our clients actually reduce the need for or like multiple doses of antihistamines a day. I'm not saying you have to stop, you yeah. get to stop entirely, but they tend to go, oh, actually, I know I'm, I, the doctor said I could take this antihistamine up to three times a day, but actually I kind of only need it twice. Mm -hmm. And I noticed I'm less reactive to things, which I really like to hear. So I feel like it helps people get going in the right direction. Uh, what a great overview. And what I love, Jen, is that you're going to the liver and what we know is when the gut has some permeability, which I think with every skin condition, there's some degree of permeability, whether it's mm -hmm. excess microbes or yeast or um, even histamine can all create that. And then what happens is the dumping of the contents of our gut into the bloodstream, which goes directly to the liver, which is like you said, and frames so well our filter organ. And what we know is at the root of even diabetes and heart disease and mood disorders and of course skin disorders is this endotoxemia, which means toxic mm -hmm. load from within. So I really, really love that you frame it as to be like, what creams and potions can we put on you? And I know that doesn't work. That's the outside in approach. But at the core, I think what you're describing is we're getting toxic, endotoxic means from mm -hmm. inside out. And that endotoxemia has a limit of what the liver can process each day. And one thing I've often said is we mobilize the toxins out of our blood, liver, kidneys, all the organs are detoxing. But if we can't excrete them, we get stuck and then that liver gets overloaded. And it sounds like that's exactly what you found to be the yep. root of most of the skin things that you advise uh, clients on. Yeah. And and you want to look in different places because some individuals do have a, con like I was saying, combination yes. of things. So it's usually, there's a, it's usually um, some sort of phase two liver detox overload. Yeah. I mean, and granted there could be nuances here where somebody has a genetic SNP or something like that mm -hmm. going on. Um, but we'll just say, generally speaking, phase two liver detox overload, there's usually some type of gut dysfunction. So perhaps we're not breaking food down or absorbing it pro appropriately. There could be issues with, um, as you were saying, eliminating things, right? Mm -hmm. So being constipated can yeah. absolutely increase skin reactivity. It can make you more itchy. It can make you feel worse and your skin to flare up much more easily. Um, we also then want to dive into things like thyroid imbalances, if that's present, yes. because there are, I mean, especially with psoriasis, mm -hmm. and I would say with urticaria, there are some really interesting overlaps with thyroid imbalances and thyroid issues like Hashimoto's. Um, we also want to look at what's going on in the gut microbiome. Do we have any foods that we are reactive to? Yeah. Um, I'm... I think that where I sort of depart, and obviously we can talk more about the diet thing, but I do think that we have focused a bit too much on assigning blame to yes. every single food that's been become deemed inflammatory by, yeah. I would say, just like the functional integrative space. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we want to be cautious where we, I think the primary focus needs to be allergies because obviously yeah. allergies, IgE allergies should be removed. If you truly have something that you're allergic to, you should not be eating it. And you might also need to avoid it in products that you put on your skin. Yeah. Um, but there are environmental factors as well. I mean, you talk a ton about mold, right? Mold can be a, be certainly a factor. So can pollen allergies, so can chemicals in your environment. So can um, we have various chemicals that are in the air like diisocyanates that we know tend to be increased um, in areas where we see higher rates of eczema, there was actually a really great paper uh, that was published a year ago, I believe it was in January of 2023, um, with a group uh, that Dr. Ian Miles was associated with that talked about this mm -hmm. chemical that is in, we're kind of inundated with, yeah. unfortunately, and they connected these really interesting dots between the incidence of eczema and the higher rates of this chemical existing in that environment. Um, and there's just so many other factors. I, I just, I think where I get a little nervous is our reliance on blaming it all on food and saying the only way is to diet your way out of these conditions. Because unfortunately, I'm the person that sees 
the folks that have taken almost everything out and they've done multiple elimination diets overlapped. And now at that point, they are so nutritionally depleted. They hate food. They hate yes. the act of eating, which is so, that breaks my heart. Yeah. Like it really, truly does. As someone who has like an Italian background and I love yeah. food, I think food gives us joy. It gives us nourishment. It's connection. When you start to hate that, maybe we need to start asking what's going on. Why are, why, what are we doing with these tools that are elimination diets and how can we potentially be smarter about them? Um, but there's so many other factors. And obviously with skin issues, there is a skin microbiome. Yeah. And so it's not just what happens internally. If you have an infection on the skin or an imbalance of what's happening on the skin, and that could look like bacterial or fungal, you can even have parasi a parasitic yeah. overgrowth such as demodex mites, which are a commensal, but mm -hmm. can overgrow in certain cases. Um, that There's no amount of like doing gut protocols that's going to necessarily fix that. So we just have to be aware of so many different facets with um, skin issues. I think like it, this has been a huge educational journey since I started working specifically with these clients since 2017 of like how many different things we need to be aware of. Wow. What a great overview. Some of the summary points I want to mention is first of all, I love that you're coming back to toxic load because at the core of that overload of liver, we know it does present in the skin. And I love that you start there versus like, let's apply a cream. Right. And you and I agree on that. I love how you're talking about elimination diets. I could not agree more in my first years of practice. We were taught, let's try these things. And sometimes it works temporarily. Mm -hmm. But what it is, is it's not a cause. It's more of a symptom of a permeable gut, right? I always say you have Swiss cheese for guts. And so if you eat corn or soy or even gluten, you're going to, those antigens will pass through the liver's like what the bloodstream first immune system's like, what the yep. heck is this? It starts to create a reaction. We start to measure those. And really the more food IgG sensitivities you have is just a symptom of a deeper problem, which is gut permeability, maybe dysbiosis, maybe toxic exposure, maybe mold. So I could not agree more. And while I do find there's a time and place for those elimination diets, even my own history with the skin issues and Crohn's disease and celiac and all those things that had severe permeability, I for years was on very, very restrictive diets. And what I've realized is that is not, you have to go to the core and maybe temporarily limit. But what my goal for patients and myself is continue to add back these nutrients because of nutrition. So thanks for saying that because a lot of people are still in the old mindset of, oh, just eliminate all these things. And people come in and they're eating four foods, right? And you've mm -hmm. seen that just like I have. And that's not nutritionally adequate. It just doesn't work long-term. No. Or even no. say FODMAP. So you have SIBO, you go on a low FODMAP, which is well-studied, evidence-based. But guess what? You're starving the microbiome. So long-term- Elimination of the foods that feed the microbiome is not a good idea. Now, short term, yes. Long term, no. <laughs> well, I also would add to that is that, so I was associated with a study that was done a couple of years ago. And um, I worked with a research team at, out of UC Davis. And we surveyed over 600 people who have chronic skin conditions. And we asked them, about the use of elimination diets to help their skin and what happened to them when they use these diets, specifically with their relationship with food. Uh -huh. And I think that is equally troubling because, so I'll just give you a couple of uh, stats here. So we even asked people in the the age group bracket, like did an elimination diet trigger a negative association with food? If you're in the 18 to 24 year old bracket, which, you know, very highly impressionable. I remember that age. If you told me to like cut all these food, I was in the like eat fat free. Yeah. That was that yep. was that that bracket for me. Um, you have over 80% of these individuals who now have a negative association with food from using an elimination diet to try to address their skin issues. Mm -hmm. That is deeply troubling yeah. because what are, you know, we have this tool, which is important, but it's how we use the tool that is also important. And what we don't want to happen is that we say, oh, well, if you do this, you, you can save your skin, you can fix it all, but yeah. you've got to like blow up your relationship with food. And I don't think that that's a fair trade-off because the, the disordered eating patterns last with you for a really, really long time. And in fact, by the time in these age brackets, you even get to the 55 to 64 year old bracket, it's still 
close to 50% of people who now have a negative association with food. And we also looked at people who um, shared with us whether they had a history of eating disorders. So anorexia, bulimia, um, binge eating, or no eating disorder history at all. And eat. so those, especially those who had a history of eating disorders, did find that this was triggering. However, even having no history of an eating disorder, you were still about 50% of people developing this negative association. So again, it's not to say that they're bad to use. It's not to say that there isn't a time and place because there certainly is. I think as clinicians, as practitioners, we have to consider, right? If we're going to talk about the whole body, the whole self, we have to factor in how this is going to impact someone, especially if, you know, I've had clients where they may have seen a doctor, the doctor said, do low histamine, low histamine didn't work. So they said, okay, let's take out all these foods. Yeah. Okay, now let's yeah. take out these. And the diet gets smaller and smaller and smaller with no regard. Yeah for how that person mentally and emotionally is handling this. Oh yeah. So seen, I think it's like, an important reminder. Low FODMAP, low oxalates, low salicylates, no glue, like you name it. And there's like, there's four foods left. And then they're like, what do I do? And it's traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, I think what I've seen is there often is a short time or place when the cytokines are overwhelming. And maybe we can go to yeah. that point, point like, where it does help to decrease the load. Mm -hmm. um, but I, doing it with the right mindset and also just talking through with them. Like maybe this is temporary or like, I often do have gluten out of patients diets. Cause that's a whole nother ball game, Same. right? Yep. But I totally agree with you 100% um, because it really is more of a symptom, not a cause of the underlying issue. So thanks yeah. for going there. Um, let's shift just briefly biological and Jack inhibitor drugs are commonly used in some of these severe conditions. Yeah. Those aren't always the end all be all because they suppress the immune system, but what can we learn from how drugs are used for these chronic inflammatory conditions that you particularly see in your practice? So I find it fascinating that I know that many of us are very, like we're very skeptical of big pharma and medications, right? And, and there are pros and cons to every single thing, but I find the fact that we have the research mm -hmm. now that's been done to at least get the FDA clearances for these medications really fascinating because we didn't know a lot of the information under that was going on under the surface, specifically with certain cytokines. And um, so I want to first say that I don't think we should think of cytokines or these inflammatory messengers as inherently bad. Mm -hmm. Because to be fair, your body uses them to try to communicate with between systems. So it's in essentially trying to help in some regards to recruit help into certain areas, um, do different things. So, so yes, too much of a certain cytokine could be problematic and also blocking certain cytokines has consequences that can be problematic. But I do think that again, this is the nuanced conversation that cytokines themselves, which are produced in our bodies, knowing which ones can be elevated, I personally think has changed how I approach skin issues. Um, I'll give you an example. So I personally think after looking at the amount of cytokines that are produced in say eczema or psoriasis or rosacea and the incidence of certain, let's just say, um, gut organisms that show up either high or are lurking under the surface that something like H. pylori, or um, which oftentimes I've found most most uh, So like I presented at a naturopathic conference about this and they're like, no, if you don't have any symptoms of H. pylori, I would never, I would never deal with it if it's high on a stool test. Like I would never do it because, you know, it's fine. It's not doing anything. And I said, but when we look at the cytokines specifically that H. pylori increases, and we know that in these particular conditions, these cytokines are elevated. Yes. Does it not? Why do we have to necessarily go off of symptoms in order to justify potentially working in that area? I have had, and I, I'm sure you've seen the same, I have had clients who have massive amounts of overgrowth, H. pylori, and tons of parasites, and they have no gut symptoms. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't understand that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. practical because like I had a lot of gut problems growing mm -hmm. up and so like that doesn't quite makes make sense to me on the practical level and yet 
when we addressed what showed up clinically based off of blood labs, stool testing, and their case history, they got better. So I don't know. And look, I'm listen, I'm not a doctor. Um, so I, I'm not saying that I'm smarter than anyone else, but it does not make sense to me that we simply say the test is 100% right. We go by that. My dad was a surgeon. He told me sometimes testing is not always the end all be all. We can't always go off of that to determine what's going on. And somebody who really looks kind of like I mean, not the attitude of Dr. House, but that show, Dr. Uh, House, where Dr. House would dig into the case and try to figure out what was going on that didn't always make sense and wasn't always clear, yeah. can be a really powerful way to help someone uncover and deal with underlying inflammatory triggers that are driving the levels high. And so does a, does dealing with H. pylori all the time make somebody's rashes go away? No. I have had some clients where it makes a huge improvement in others. They've got so much else going on. It's like a piece yeah. of the puzzle. Um, but I do think that when you look at certain things like that, and you we look at like, for example, with um, psoriasis, we tend to see elevations of IL-17 or interleukin-17, interleukin-23 as well. And so if you start to look at the literature and what do these IL-17 blockers, for example, do, they block this the IL-17, which is actually there to help control fungal overgrowth. Yes. yes. And I and and if this is news to you, for anyone listening, there tends to be a lot of fungal problems. Yes. It's not the whole thing, but there's a lot of fungal yes. problems underlying psoriasis. I think and that's so, the elephant in the room. Let's just say I know. it again, because if I look back at my history, Crohn's, celiac, and eczema, mm -hmm. maybe 60 to 80% of it was fungal issues. And I want to say that exactly. clearly because many doctors, even if functional doctors are not looking at that, they look at SIBO and they're ignoring SIFO. Exactly. And the other part is that they, I, I think one of the, the biggest, and I don't know where I learned this from, but that we really, obviously we can't really test for CFO. So you have to mm -hmm. look at the case. You have yeah. to consider all the factors. Um, I've also found that sometimes like with eczema, sometimes rashes in certain areas yeah. tend to, and I, it doesn't mean you have, um, excess candida or malassezia or some sort of fungal overgrowth on the skin, but for some reason, the inflammation will show up in certain yeah. areas, like the inner elbow on, in the armpits behind the knees, the feet, the areas where we tend to sweat more. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that can correlate with an underlying fungal issue. Um, and so. So I just, I find it fascinating. So, so I really, uh, number one, I, I want to just say, I think, and I think we're on the same page about this because not everyone can go the distance to get to fully healed in entirely doing it the natural way. Yeah. And so I'm, I don't want anyone to think that like, I'm saying these medications like jack inhibitors, which do carry by the way, a black box warning um, and biologic drugs. I mean, they do like, you should always look at the, the information that's provided to you online, talk with your doctor, talk with your pharmacist, ask a lot of questions, go in with your eyes wide open. But sometimes we need help because the level yes. of suffering is so great that you're not getting that time back. You know, life is so finite, it's so precious. And to suffer for years when you could have been at your kid's soccer game, yeah. right? But you couldn't do it because your skin was so bad um, or any number of other, like be at your mother or father's 85th birthday party. You couldn't make it because of X, Y, Z was like all flared up. I sometimes think, how can we find a way to do the path that makes the most sense for the individual so that they get to have some semblance of a life that they're comfortable with while they do that underlying work. And it is important for people to hear that you can do the underlying work while you're on those medications. And it is possible to wean off of them as well without flaring up as long as you really dealt with those underlying factors. So I just, I want people to know that because a lot of times they think it's this either or conversation, 
But if you have like psoriasis and you start developing psoriatic arthritis, yeah. um, the the doctors that I've interviewed who work with that condition and they're more in the integrative space have said as as the damage is done to those yeah. joints, you're not there is no recovering from that, unfortunately, yeah. at this point in time. So that sometimes is, for example, will warrant the use of a biologic drug to bring those cytokines down continue to do the underlying work and then eventually being able to get hopefully off of the drug because we just want to save the joints. Mm -hmm. So I just want people to know that th you're and not Jen, a failure. I could not agree more. I think this is yeah. very important because like I deal with a lot of Crohn's and colitis. It's a very yeah. similar field where biologicals help. And I would say 50% or more patients either come to me and are so desperate they need biological drugs because what I can do is going to take more time than they can, they don't need to suffer or they already come in and they're like, Oh, is it too late? The answer is no, it absolutely controls. And for me, it actually buys time because the root mm -hmm. cause medicine often takes six months, 12 months, maybe even longer. And, um, I totally agree. And each individual circumstance is appropriate to look at, and I'll even actually test TNF alpha and cytokine so that I know, is this appropriate drug? Cause I want to know, is that cytokine high? So I'm actually going to those levels and saying, do you have the cytokine that this drug blocks? because it will work if that cytokine is elevated and it's perfectly appropriate. So I love that perspective. Um, in our last few minutes, do you want to give like a little, uh, we've been, there's so many, so many important things, the liver, yeah. um, the diets, like what's really important, maybe what's not long-term important with elimination, the drugs when they're appropriate. Um, what would be like your top tips? If someone's out there saying, I have struggled with eczema forever. Um, where do I start, Jen? What would you, what advice would you give them? The first thing that I would do is um, definitely support your liver, specifically that phase two detox nutritionally. And so one of the easiest ways you can do that is by adding in supplemental glycine, the amino acid glycine to your diet. Um, I don't find that doing it just through collagen supplementation to be sufficient enough. I don't know why. I found it to be more effective when you actually take the amino acid, and you're usually taking somewhere between three to five grams mm -hmm. or 3000 to 5000 milligrams, like twice a day. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely consider that as a factor to start with. Um, also potentially looking at how much vitamin B6 that you're taking, because those pathways also need vitamin B6. Um, I can't tell you exactly how much to take because you can take too much. So I think generally speaking, people can stick somewhere around like 10 to 20 milligrams a day. You can look at all your supplements. Sometimes it's in your multi and that can be like a really easy way to just base the baseline of supporting the liver. There's certainly more supports that you can do. Um, and I talk about that in the healthy skin show, but that's, that's a good baseline. The second thing that I would consider is educating yourself on what a skin infection looks like, because oftentimes people will think that they're just in a flare that goes for eczema. It even goes for psoriasis and some of these other conditions as well. We think the skin gets really angry and upset and they're just, it's just really flared up. And so we're trying to use various creams and ointments and all sorts of things. When in reality, there's an infection present. So educating yourself on what the symptoms are of an infection. And if you believe that you have one going to the doctor. Yes, you have to go to the doctor and ask for a skin culture with sensitivity testing. Mm -hmm. So that way they can determine, is there something overgrown and then what will kill it essentially? So yeah, there's times where we could say, oh, let's use colloidal silver or hypochlorous acid. But if you have like a full-blown infection or you have something like eczema herpeticum, which is this reemergence of the herpes virus mm -hmm. that can actually cause you to go blind if it gets, and it will creep, it can creep into the eyes. So we want to like jump on that right away. Those infections are really, really important. Um, and lastly, I would say uh, definitely looking at gut function. So look at how many times a day you're having a bowel movement. One to three times a day is probably the optimal, I would say, to shoot for. I know we get obsessed with having the perfect poop, but the reality is we just got to start someplace. So figure out using different tools, whether it's digestive enzymes or some sort of probiotics or whatever, to try and help get that regularity back into the flow of things. Um, and the other thing I will say is that looking at your skincare, considering 
what can be helpful? Unfortunately, it's trial and error. <laughs> a lot of times yeah. we, there's no one cream that's going to work for everyone. Um, but I find that when you can find the right combination to really help support your skin, whether it's with eczema where it's super itchy mm -hmm. or you're dealing with psoriasis where you have these really scaly plaques, if you can find something or a combination of things to at least help you manage while you're in the process, that can really be helpful. Skin um, baths specifically with sea salt um, and other minerals can be really um, soothing. Um, and I would just say in general, last point, nervous system work is really important because a lot of times we develop trauma from what happens to our skin. And so it's really easy to feel a flare coming on, not know what to do, start to panic because you're reliving the past flare up that you had and the mind and nervous system goes on overdrive. So it worsens every experience that you're having throughout your body. And so whether that's talking with a therapist, doing gratitude work, breath work, whatever you can do to also help support the nervous system and try to remind it as many times as you can a day, even putting post-it notes on the mirrors that you are safe <laughs> your body loves you, that it's trying its darndest to support you because that's literally what it is trying to do. It's not working against you. That is a really important foundation for this entire journey that you can go on. There's so many things that I could dive into that are like specific to different conditions, um, which I'm sure we could talk about. But um, I think these are kind of like a good foundation for everyone. Those are so practical and so, so applicable. I love it. I especially love the glycine. Um, I found that to be such a key. It's a rate limiting step in glutathione production. It's core for glyphosate detox and so many of the things. It's just an essential amino acid. And like you said, I actually have people take grams of that, not just uh, as a supplemental collagen. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm sorry you went through your own journey, but what a wealth of knowledge. Uh, where can people find you? And I know you have a free resource for our listeners. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah. So I uh, can be found on the Healthy Skin Show podcast. As I shared, we have over 350 episodes. You're on the podcast as well. Um, and that can be, you can actually find the whole show on YouTube, uh, on my YouTube channel. Or if you go to healthyskinshow.com, you'll find every single episode, which we have transcripts, links, everything that you could possibly need. And then we also have a guide that I think is really helpful because a lot of times people say, oh my gosh, you've 350 episodes. Like, where do yeah. I start? What's, what are like the first few episodes I need to listen to, to understand how this process that you go through is different from just like the integrative approach. Yeah. And so we have a guide called the stop my rashes guide. And, um, I'm sure we can link that up yes. in the show notes that will give you like the first few episodes that are really crucial to build that foundational knowledge. And then you can, we have links for like all of the different special, like the, the, the various diagnoses yeah. and such that you can dive into on that topic. So, um, that's a really great place. And obviously I'm here on YouTube as well. And, um, yeah, that, that, those are really the best places to find me. And as you had shared in the beginning, I have a supplement and skincare line that's specific for people who have chronic skin issues at quellshop.com. Awesome. Jen, thank you for sharing your wealth. And like I said, it's always, it's so interesting with guests of what you've been through can kind of drive your passion and purpose. And you've clearly done that. And that's what so beautiful is we, when we transform those experiences to help others, you're mm -hmm. out there doing that. So thank you. And skin, very personal to me. I so appreciate your work. Um, and thanks for coming on today. Thank you for having me.